Hello and welcome to another episode of the Football 365 Isolation Show. I'm your host, Mark Smith, and I'm here sort of as ever now with Deputy Editor of Football365.com. It's Matt Stead. Matt Stead, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Mark. How are you? Good. I'm much better because football is not properly, but sort of back. How are you feeling about it? It's uh, yeah, it's a it's a nice nice relief, nice little distraction from everything that's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you watch much of it? I've seen bits and pieces. Yeah, just more out of kind of curiosity than anything, just to kind of see um, see what the situation was. Because obviously, the Bundesliga have got they've got this massive long list of uh, um, like kind of precautions that they have to take for games to yeah. go ahead and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it was just uh, it was intriguing to kind of see. And hear literally everything, basically. I think that was that was the main thing that I took away from the weekend is the the sound of the stanchions when uh, when all the goals went in. It was it was very nice. Really enjoyed it. It was, yeah. And actually, there was something quite charming about it, wasn't there? It, it felt like a. Uh, it felt like when you go and watch football down down the road, you watch the the under eights play six a side or whatever, or you watch the under 15s play on a full size pitch, and all you can hear is the parents and a few coaches. And I found it quite. I found it quite weirdly relaxing and grounding. And it made me think, you know what, this is what football's all about. It's not about the multi-million pound, this and that. It's about the game, pure and simple. Um, do you see us being able to successfully replicate what Germany have done with this behind closed doors? Or do you see us messing it up somehow? I, I mean, yeah, that would, be the, that would be the English way, wouldn't it? To kind of <laughs> mess it up in a way. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting to see, because obviously Germany are a bit further ahead in terms of how they've dealt with the whole thing. Yep. Um, it would be interesting to see, obviously, the plans at the minute are kind of skeletal as they are. They're, they're very kind of they're taking as many precautions as possible. We're only just returning to training in five groups and stuff like that. So it, yeah. it comes to a stage where and we've still got a lot of players to persuade, like Troy Deeney's come out and said um, stuff about if he, he can't go to his hairdresser, but he's expected to be going for corners with 19 other people in the box. Yeah, yeah. Pulling shirts and stuff. So it's, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of obstacles to overcome, but I think it's it's nice to see at least one country kind of get into grips with it. I think. Yeah, absolutely, and I think actually there was a lot of talk over the weekend about how oh you know what it's not the same without fans, and of course I'm sure you agree with me. It isn't the same without fans. We know it's not going to be the same without fans. But what we saw was two teams in every game, two teams on the pitch who were really properly playing. It wasn't like what I feared, which would be a testimonial pace or a pre-season friendly type pace. Everyone seemed, maybe not 100% fit, but certainly fit enough to put on a show. And everyone seemed, you know, seriously competitive. So it was like watching a proper game. I had no issue with it. And if we can get anything like that here, then I think it's a great thing. But this idea of saying, I'd rather not have football if the fans aren't there, I just think it's ludicrous because I think we're much better off having football because it means that a lot of clubs will still exist for a start. And it means that you can still see your favourite club play in six months or whenever it is, uh, you know, live at the stadium. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't really, I don't understand the argument. If, if it is safe for players to play, I don't understand the argument to suggest that we shouldn't do it. Um, right. Because at the end of the day, it is, it is a nice distraction. It is, it, it's, it's, kind of, it's something we all need, I think. It's something to yeah. kind of look forward to at the weekend and stuff like that. So it, it is nice to see that kind of... Yes. Back, and I'm sure Dini... But Troy Deeney is absolutely right to have to have reservations. I mean, he's got he's got a, a very young son who, as he says, has had uh, issues with breathing. I mean, how could you possibly expect Troy Deeney to go back and just play as normal? He's someone who he's shown in the past is he's outspoken, he's intelligent, he's not afraid to get stuck in, and and really give it to people above him in the chain of command of the Premier League. There's no reason why we should expect him to go back to work as normal, like he says, when, when he can't go to the barber shop. So as long as, like you say, players' safety is taken as, as the, the, main, um, the main point, then, yeah, hopefully we can get some football back. Uh, to the games themselves, though, Matt, uh, what did you watch and what were you impressed by? Uh, I saw a bit of Dortmund's win over Schalke. Um, very impressed as ever by the robot that is Erling Haaland and especially <laughs> as much interview where he spoke I think he spoke about 13 or 14 words or something like that the interview was desperately trying to get some sort of answers out of him but he was very yes and no because yeah. at the end of the day he's a 19 year old you're not going to get many words out of a 19 year old at any kind of situation but especially a, 
a footballer who's kind of he's focused literally just on scoring goals, which you've got to appreciate. Yeah, yeah and also the, the, there's something to be said about this, though. I think we um, we expect too much from from young footballers. I mean, I remember interviewing Marcus Rashford when he was probably about 18, and he was thrust into this situation where we had lights and cameras all over the place. And he's an 18 year old kid at the time, and he's just a shy, normal guy who happens to be brilliant at football. Why should we expect him to be outstanding away from the pitch under the lights as he is on the pitch? It, it just seems like we're, we have these ridiculous high expectations. If Erling Haaland wants to come out and say five words in an interview, let him do that. It's fine. You know, he, he's learning his craft. He shouldn't have to. I think we both know that the media side of it goes hand in hand a little bit now as a player. But at the same time, he is just a kid still. Just, you know, I think give him a break. Yeah, that's it. And I've seen a lot of people kind of compare him, not necessarily unfavourably or anything, but they've compared that kind of interview style to Zlatan. Um, right. Whereas I think that's that's very much kind of, that's a confected, manufactured kind of, he's, he's carefully crafted that kind of image over a lot yes. of years. Whereas with Haaland, there is, like you say, he's, he literally is just there to play football. He's not... Yeah. He's not there to, uh, to talk about anything in particular. He's not there to be interviewed. He's, he's got, obviously, obligations and stuff like that. But like I say, you're not going to get many answers out of a 19-year-old lad. At the no, end of the day. he might just be shy. And, and sometimes shyness gets misinterpreted as arrogance or cockiness or whatever. And I think it's or aloofness, I suppose. And I think, you know, let's just let him get on with scoring goals and maybe the rest of the media side will come later on. Uh, Bayern Munich also won to stay top of the league uh, away at Union Berlin. Did you see any of that? Uh, I didn't uh, catch any of that, unfortunately, but I did. I was just going to say about the, the Dortmund game, I quite appreciated uh, Steve McManaman's co-commentary, talking about oh my how God. Dortmund were in excellent form, apparently. Yeah, um, excellent which, form. Which is quite, it's, yeah, it's a statement to make when literally no clubs have played for, for two months. Yeah. Which is, what, is, what, is, what does form mean? Who knows? Exactly, yeah. It's gone, it's gone out the window. They've not won. They've not won in two months, so they're, they're in terrible <laughs> Terrible form. Um, generally speaking, I think I think Dortmund um, look like they're going to be the main challengers to Bayern, as has been the case for for a little while now. Um, mm. But still, it's you know we've got a few games left to play. It's it's still it's something that I can really see myself getting excited by in lieu of Premier League football. While we're waiting for that to come back, I can see myself really getting on board with this. And I think of all the leagues in in, in Europe, if one was to come back, Germany would be right up there. I think obviously Spain would probably be number one away from England. Germany number two, would you say? I'd say so, yeah. It's, it's, it's not necessarily the style of the football, but a lot of it is the players. Like Sancho, obviously, he only played yes. um, a few minutes at the end. But Sancho, Lewandowski scored. Um, Haaland, who we've just spoken about. It's, it's these kind of these individual players who we only kind of know in terms of like transfer gossip columns and stuff like that. Kai Havertz, yeah, that's he right. scored um, two goals for Leverkusen. He's been linked with, I think it's Man United, Chelsea and Liverpool today. Co completely Everyone. coincidentally, just scored two goals. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, but you're um, right. They, yeah, Germany have got nice some. Well. They've got some marquee players, haven't they, Germany? Yeah, definitely. Germany, it was nice as well to see, like you say, um, it will be between Bayern and Dortmund now. But obviously, it was kind of a three-horse race at one point with Leipzig, um, yeah. and they dropped uh, everyone's favourite team. Home. I think it was, yeah, they dropped a couple of points at home to Freiburg. I think it was, but they had a um, a last-minute winner disallowed by VAR, which was. Again, it was it was nice to see VAR come back into our into our lives after a, a nice two month. <laughs> yeah, do you remember when VAR was the biggest thing in all our lives? Yeah, exactly. It was, we didn't have anything to complain about, did we? No, that's it. Right, let's move back to uh, to England though, because there was a good mail we had this week from Ben in Chester. Uh, ben says. I see Patrick Van Aardolt has followed Gary Neville in coming out with the view that Aaron wan is a better defender than Trent Alexander-Arnold. Like, this is a groundbreaking declaration. As a Liverpool fan, have I missed the part where anyone thinks Trent is a better defender than Aaron wan -Bissaka? He's a better all-round player, the definition of the new breed of attacking fullback, and fits perfectly into Liverpool's system. But I haven't seen one person say Trent is a better pure defender than Aaron wan purely because he clearly isn't. Seems like a lot of straw men arguing going on to me. That's Ben in Chester. Thanks, Ben. Um, I mean, he's spot on, isn't he? Why are we having this argument still? Well, yeah, exactly. It's, it's straight. I don't think, like you say, I don't think any Liverpool fans really realistic, yeah, realistically sorry, argue that Alexander Arnold's a better defender. No, he's he's clearly a better forward player because he's he's not even really a fullback at the end of the day. He's kind of 
he, he'll stand there when they take when they when they kick off, and then he'll sprint <laughs> to the field of the pitch and uh, yes. swing balls into the box from there. He's not really a fullback, whereas Wan Bissaka is very much kind of the absolute defensive one on one. Can we can we talk about these two in terms of England then? We've had at least a year now added on to wait for the next Euros. You know, hoping it's going to happen next season. There's not there's no guarantee it will do, but let's assume it happens next season. So they both got a, an extra year now to try and stake their their claim for that place at right back. Um, given that we know that one is better than the other at defending, and given that we know Liverpool play a very different way to England, is it nailed on that Trent is England's number one fullback? I wouldn't say it's nailed on. No, it's, it's it's it depends, like you say, on on what kind of style Southgate favours. Because if it was a case of obviously at the World Cup, they played three at the back with um with the wing backs, and yes. if it was that, then I think you'd probably have to have Alexander Arnold. Um, no debate there. No debate there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas if it's if it's a four man defence, I don't know. It depends whether you can trust the centre halves there, and obviously you've got Harry Maguire on one side. And we don't really know who the other one is. So there could be a case for Wan Bissaka kind of starting there. Yeah. Um, over but, like, Maybe, but likewise, if Gomez is in, you'd say we'll play Trent then because they know each other. Yeah, exactly. And, and you kind of, there's a, there's a case where you look at the Premier League, you look at where most of your players are going to come from if you're the England manager, and you're going to kind of try and replicate as much as you can of the absolute best team. And that is yes. far and away Liverpool. Comfortably. So at the end of the day, yeah. If you do that, then you do start Alexander Arnold next to next to Gomez, say, which it, it would be harsh on Mbappé. But then, I think a lot, I think too much is made of how how Alexander Arnold's not great in defence because he's come yeah. up against. He has had he's had a couple of shockers. He had one shocker against Rashford, and I think um, the week after that, it was like 2018. The week after that, he had a really poor game against Zaha once. Yeah. Um, but he he's not as bad a defender as people make out. I think people can't. No, and also, he's very young. He's very, very young still, isn't he? Mm. He's younger so he's than Wan-Bissaka. Got... So, yeah. so he's got years to work that. out his defensive game. Yeah, Yeah, you look at that in terms of their development. I'd say Alexander Arnold's a bit further ahead. But I don't, I don't know. Wan-Bissaka, I think we've said before, Wan-Bissaka is he is improving, undeniably. He's, he's getting yes. better at attack. But he's, he's very much more of a defensive right back. Do you want to know what I'd do, Matt? Go on. I would uh, absolutely start Trent. Um, and what I do is, we don't see the position very often anymore, but whenever we played a top team uh, with an outstanding individual, a Ronaldo or a Messi or whoever, obviously not for the Euros, but on the, on the global stage, I would want to deploy a man marker. And I can't think of a better player in the country or in Europe to play as a, a man-to-man marking role than Aaron Wambasaka. I think he's got everything. No. I think you're probably right. He, he strikes me as an absolute dick to play against, doesn't he? he Awful. He's, he's had, yeah, I think it was the last Manchester derby where Sterling ba- barely had a kick. Um, yeah. I think the first 10 minutes or so, he was all right, but then wan Bissaka just absolutely annihilated him after that. So I think it, th- there is a case. And when you look at them both, if you look at Alexander-Arnold and wan Bissaka, you kind of try and make as many moves as possible to try and get them both in the same team. I think there's yes. probably an argument for yeah, I, th- I think if wan was an inch or two taller, he'd be an outstanding centre-back. But, you know, he isn't. And he's got Trent to contend with probably for the, the entirety of his career because they're both so young. Uh, but with England, I mean, we work in cycles with England, don't we? Where we go from having lots of good players in one position and an absolute dearth of talent in another one. At the minute, our right-back situation is incredible. I mean, the two yeah, you've mentioned... Some... Yeah. Well, go on. We've got, obviously, Reese James as well, who's kind of... If he looks carries superb. on as he is, he looks like a combination of the two, I think. He's, he's <laughs> yeah. in defense, and then he's he's pretty good in attack as well. So yeah, if he kind of develops as he should, then you've got three and they're all at top kind of Champions League clubs, aren't they? So they're all playing ridiculous opposition week in, week out, and you kind of look at it and think, how are you going to choose between those three? But on top of those guys, you've also got great experience in Kyle Walker. When he's not out and about breaking lockdown, he is still a very solid choice. Uh, uh, you know, either if you play three at the back on the right hand side for England or at, at fullback itself. Kieran Trippier, we forget about him. He's had a great season in Spain up to this point. You know, yeah, again, absolutely. another world class club. There, there's no reason why he couldn't still push for that for that position. So this is for the first time in my life. 
we've seen so many quality right backs at once. And it's strange because at left back, where we've been traditionally very strong, there's not that much there at the moment. Yeah, it's difficult to kind of say, obviously we've got um, Euro 2021, even though they're still calling it Euro 2020 next year. Um, it's difficult to say kind of who'd start for England there, whether it be, we've had Danny Rose before, we've had Ben Chilwell, Bakayu yeah, yeah. Saka, maybe. If you, give, if you give Saka at Arsenal another year, then there's every Absolutely. chance that he'd kind that's of the one, yeah, That's the one I was thinking. I was, I was thinking actually that this extra year gives someone like Saka a great chance and Dean Henderson uh, in goal as well. Because it was unlikely that Southgate yeah, would definitely. change goalkeepers so close to the to the Euros. Or, well, what about Luke Shaw? Is he is he toast now? Is he done, or do you think he's still got a uh, opportunity? It's difficult to say with Shaw because obviously he's, he's not even playing left back for United at the minute. He's kind of he's in that three man central defence. He's playing on the yeah. left side of it, but they've got Brandon Williams there. At, uh, at what the, is he uh, a shout then? Is he is he a shout, Brandon Williams? Possibly, yeah. Like you say, it's the same case with Henderson. Like. They've had brilliant seasons, but this is like their first Premier League season, basically. So there's there's always that risk with the major international tournament. Do you throw them straight in? But if you give them another year, if you give them another year against this kind of opposition, then yeah, you kind of see Henderson coming in for Pickford. You kind of see maybe yeah. Williams getting a shout in the squad or something like that. It could look very different this time next year. Right, Matt Stead, that's all we've got time for this week. Uh, thanks very much for watching, guys. If you've got anything you want to tell the show, write in with any gripes or any great insight that you've got into our beautiful game do email us it's at the editor at football365.com uh, until next time thanks Matt Stead thank you and thanks for watching guys cheers bye bye